Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so excited today to be joined by the wonderful Charles Shire, who's the director and co-writer of the film The Noel Diary. And I wanted to start by talking a little bit about the writing process alongside your co-writers, Rebecca Connor and David Golden, um, just in terms of the way that, that you decided narratively where you wanted to give the audience a lot of exposition around the central character of Jake, played by Justin Hartley, and how you wanted to build out his narrative, because so much of the, the film is us gradually getting to know more about his backstory, his history with his family and everything that leads him on the journey that he's going in because there's moments where we're being given details as the film develops and then moments where we're kind of allowed to put together the pieces ourselves. So I was interested in that journey and the writing process. Well, uh, truthfully, um, David Golden wrote uh, a script based on on the novel and that's that's how I got involved because uh, Netflix came to me and sent me that script. And uh, I, I've never met David Golden, so I never didn't work with him actually. But uh, I did talk to him on the phone once, uh, you know, after the movie was finished. But um, so basically, I went in, I went in and um, and met with Netflix, and uh, he had, I think, been fairly, um, I think, fairly. Um, uh, he, I think he did a lot of the, his, it was a fairly uh, accurate adaptation. Um, and I felt um, that the movie was maybe, it could be lighter uh, and deeper and, and I could make it more my own kind of movie, you know, rather the kind of movies I make. And so, and I gave Netflix all my notes and and I had a lot of them. I changed, we, you know, a lot. And then I, um, I went. My, I, I, I worked with my friend Rebecca Connor, who's a, who's a college professor. And uh, we basically rewrote the movie, and, um, and that was that. You know, we made you know a lot of changes. Yeah. Uh, it was a more serious kind of book, I think. You know, a little bit more. Uh, I don't know. I, I I felt at times it got it got too. Um, you know, I'm very worried about being corny in my movies. You know, and and I just didn't want that to happen. You know, and I didn't want it to be sappy, or anything like that. So um, we departed a lot from the novel and the other screenplay. Interesting. And and then as you started to to map out the way that you wanted to visually tell the story on screen, um, I've heard you talk about how you're always kind of meticulously storyboarding everything out. Um, and so what was what does that process look like for you as you're starting to figure out, OK, what's the what's the visual aesthetic that I want? What's the colors that I want to use? You know, what's what are those initial ideas of locations and production design and costume coming together as you're figuring out what how you're going to potentially move the camera around the story as well? Right. It's um, well, I uh, on this movie, I, I worked with Ashley Rowe, who's my director of photography, who I've done four movies with. So we have a shorthand and that really makes things easier. But I do storyboard everything in advance and especially a movie like this, which had a, a small budget starting with and it, a 27 day shoot. You know, it's a road movie, which is really complicated. So you have to uh, really prepare. You know, so we rehearsed for a couple of weeks. Uh, I did storyboard everything. I worked with people that I really knew and trusted, and um, and 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 it's a movie. It's oddly enough, it's a movie with five prints. You know, there's five actors who are who have really huge parts, uh, are, are are you know seminal parts, and uh, so I, I was very careful about casting them, and um, I, everything was pretty well worked out. You had to move fairly quickly. Uh, so I want, I, 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 preparation is everything in movies. So, uh, and, but we, we had a, a big problem because we started out in Vancouver and we, we prepped the whole movie up there. In fact, we scouted locations, we hired crew, we, ha we started casting, we had extras and all that. And then COVID came along and we got booted out of Canada and we had to go to uh, Connecticut and we had to start all over again. And we, we hit in the middle of summer and a huge heat wave and um the, the budget escalated because of this huge move and starting all over um and it was complicated because there was obviously no snow and we were shooting in 100 degree weather sometimes you know so um 
it, things got a little sidetracked, but it was always a pleasant experience. I, I really liked making the movie. I liked uh, Netflix gave me a lot of uh, uh, creative space and I love the actors, you know, so it was a good experience ultimately. That's so great. You know, and obviously whenever, whenever there's any romantic element in a story, there's the, the, the pacing of that and how that connectivity comes together and, you know, how soon is too soon before we start to kind of see the, the real sparks going between them or something happens. And so in finding that, that centralized chemistry and that narrative arc between Jake and Rachel at the center of the film, um, what was that, that journey, like both in, in the, the writing, the rewriting process of the script and in terms of directing and editing and really just finding those beats of what are the moments that the audience need to feel like there's movement and growth but never feeling like you're moving it forward too quickly right well you know a, a lot of these christmas movies uh are uh, the kind of movie where the woman the actress uh has gone christmas shopping and comes out with an armful of presents and bumps into the cute guy and drops all the presents he picks them up and they connect uh i <laughs> I didn't want to make that kind of movie. And and so what what happened was I think why this movie works is because they they are not it's not all about, you know, you know, it's not a gooey kind of thing where they're, you know, you know, big eyes and stuff at each other because there's so much else going on. And they go and and they travel this journey together and help each other th through it. And through and and because of that, I think um you start to root for them to be together. They help each other. And I and so the romance, it, it felt very natural by the time they get together. I never felt it was rushed or anything. It was always um, because they didn't start out as, you know, digging each other that much. You know, I, I never I, I kind of played against that, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty much. So uh, and that was a conscious choice. Right. And, and you bring up such a great point there about it not being about the romanticism as, as the driving force, but each of them needing to go on their own internal journey and internal trajectory. And there's there's parallels that are pulling them together because of that, but they're on very different types of journeys, even though there's similarities. And so how did you find the moments where you wanted there to be slight moments of parallel between the two of them or just emotionally where they're at and where you wanted them to kind of be in their own little corners, figuring out their own sides of themselves? Well, I always, you know, I wanted it to be uh, clear that they were supporting each other and they were on each other's team. And uh, like uh, Barrett's character really helps uh, Justin's character face his his dad. And and then Justin, of course, goes to, uh, you know, to, to Noel and, and, and talks to her. Um, so I, I felt... Um, I wanted to keep it kind of real, you know, I mean, as as real as you can in a movie, you know, and so um, that was the main thing. I think that they supported each other. They started out not knowing each other at all, you know, and then, of course, she can sing, which was pretty appealing and um, and and speaks all these different languages. So there were things things revealed and she didn't know he was a she was a, he was a famous writer, which I thought was kind of charming. Um, so, I mean, all of that, it's, it's, it's kind of, you don't expose everything right away. You know, you kind of unpeel the onion and it, it gives you an opportunity to maybe make the characters a little bit, have more depth and more substance and make it more real. You know, and that's you, always the thing I want. I want it to, to at least I try to have it be real, you know? And within that as well, you also get to, to have this really lovely balance of tones where it, it's, you know, it, it's a film where we do have a moment where we have Justin Hartley's character, Jake, reconnecting with his dad after years. And, and that's a more dramatic scene. But there are lightness and, and humoristic moments as well. Like when she like when you said she doesn't know at first that he's a famous writer yeah. and she's going, oh, we should do separate checks because I don't want you yeah. to have to pay for my dinner. And there's a bus that pulls up in the background that she can't see with the billboard with his face. Um, and so what were the elements of just finding where you wanted to have that more light elements of lightness and and that be the tone or little comedic moments that could pull us into that sphere alongside the, the dramatic well you know it's it's like billy wilder said you know nancy and i nancy myers and i worked with him a little bit when we were doing baby boom and he he said to us uh 
you know, we all want the same thing. Uh, uh, those of us who are filmmakers, we want to make the audience laugh and we want to make them cry. And if you can pull that off, you've really achieved something. And that's kind of what I, I, I kind of just go on my instincts, you know, uh, that, that scene that you talk about where the bus pulls up was very hard to stage to get that bus in the right, to get a big bus in the right frame was, was difficult, but I knew it would work if we pulled it off. So we took the time. That's the other thing. When you prep, um, when you're judicious in the way you prep, you allow yourself the freedom to maybe do five more takes, you know, and, and get it right rather than having it be not perfect, which we all aim for. Or yeah. I do at least. <laughs> and, and with that idea of, you know, always making sure that you get the takes that you need and you have what you need before you're wrapping up because you're not coming back to film that scene the next day if there's something that didn't quite gel. Are you in essence also creating a rough cut and starting to edit together scenes just in your mind as you're filming things thinking like, okay, that's going to be the take that's going to work for this coverage. We're going to piece that together with that. Or is it something where you want to kind of wait till you're in the edit room to start going through the rough cuts? Yeah. I, I usually wait till I get in the edit room and with somebody like Justin, um, you know, he would always um, surprise me. And then when I'd be in the editing room, um, I, I, I sometimes didn't realize the, the choices I'd have. And, and that was really, kind of um a great problem to have because they were always so good and barrett um as well well all of them bonnie and james they were all they all delivered essence atkins on that rooftop scene is brilliant i think you know i mean she's just delivered she has one scene well she does the voice of the young noel but uh she just delivered uh, you know i i kind of teared up i was watching on on the rooftop uh, adjacent and uh i knew I knew the way she was reacting that that really worked. But sometimes you you just instinct, you know, you you try, you know, your best. I think I don't think I cut any scenes out of this movie. I think everything's there that, that I shot pretty much. That's amazing. And and because you're bringing up as well, like when when you're watching your monitor during takes as well and just kind of getting that that vision of, okay, this is working. This is really hitting. This is how I'm feeling. Um, there's something I've heard you mention about how it's really important for you to have your own monitor. And if there's other producers and other people that need to be watching a monitor to have a separate one so that you're not being influenced by what are their facial expressions? Are they shaking their head slightly? What What was the point in your career where you realized that that was a real necessity for you? And what's the benefit that that gives you? Well, Nancy and I always realized it, but you know, I'm Marty, Martin Scorsese has a rear view mirror on his chair. So if somebody comes up behind him, he sees them. You know, I, I didn't want, I oh, I insist on, on the producers having their own monitor because I, I don't, I like the script supervisor near me and, uh, you know, if, if there's a co-writer, but I don't really, um, I, you know, I just like to have my own opinions. You know, I'm not big on, you know, um, uh, yeah, I, and I, don't, you know, I, I didn't know these producers. So, you, you know, there's a level because they have the title of producer doesn't mean you trust them. You know what I'm saying? So, um, and I had, you know, you have to remember, I had Nancy for all those years who I did trust. So, um, you know, it's hard to get that caliber of brain at every uh, at every turn. I love that. You know, and going back to the music of the film, which obviously is such a part of elevating the story and, and really building upon what you have on screen. And you were bringing up the moment where Barrett Doss is, is singing as Justin's playing the piano. I really love the the specific music and there's a very classical feel to a lot of the, the song choices and the music composition. And so how did you set about, you know, what's the song going to be for that particular scene and moment? Because it's such an important moment between these characters. And then what's the rest of the music around that in the film? going to look like right well i you know baby won't you please come home it had uh, you know had so many meanings for her and that's why i thought that was the right one you know i, I i'm I, for me like the score of a movie is so important and and you know i my one of the people who i just idolized was Ennio marconi and I, I was trying to find uh, a composer who could give me that kind of a uh, theme and stuff and dara taylor uh, just nailed it. I mean, she's a, just an, I, I just feel so lucky that I found her and that I could work with her because she's going to be a superstar. And then 
you know, my I, I write songs too, and and I I wrote three songs in this movie with Minnie Murphy, who's a Nashville singer songwriter. So um, I have those, and I my friend Steve Tyrell sang a song in the movie. Actually, two songs one one that we wrote, and one I'll be home for Christmas. So, um, and then I love that doo wop song that's in the movie. I don't know; it's just my taste, you know. But it, the 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 bedrock of, of everything was Morricone, I think, on those themes, those beautiful themes that can really move you, you know, like Cinema Paradiso. He did, and you know, you know, he's brilliant. Absolutely. And and also going back to one of the other scenes that you were mentioning before in terms of where Justin Hartley's character, Jake, is is reconnecting and, and seeing his dad. And it's been so many years since they've even been in a room together. What were some of the, the delicacies, delicacies or intricacies that came with a particular scene like that where, you know, again, it's that's part of what's building the connection between Jake and Rachel, even though it's not directly doing so because it's about him, you know, finding closure on something from his past and able to be able to move forward. Well, you know, and then, and of course, he wants to give up and he leaves and she says, don't leave, you know, you'll whatever, uh, you know, you'll be just like the rest of the people in your family who just failed. But I think that the key to that is you have James Remar, who's a great actor and um, and he and Justin really connected. And I didn't, you know, if you hire, it's like Hitchcock said, if you hire great people, you don't have to do that much. They'll give you choices. And those two are great. And 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 James is just a he's just just a fantastic actor. And 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 so to have those two in a room together, my work was basically set the camera up and let them go, you know. And and with that idea of, you know, getting different choices from performers with Barrett and Justin in particular, what was the main dynamic of of working with them and really just setting up that space so that they could give you the different dimensions and the different options for scenes so that when you're editing, you've got all those different possibilities? Well, we did a lot of uh, we did a lot of rehearsals and readings and stuff like that whole part of the movie. I don't want to give things away, but there's a thing at the end where he says he says to her, tell me. Uh, you don't love me. You know, that that all came out of an improv that we did in my hotel room, you know, and, and once you and it rings true. Well, when something when they're, they're they're so into it, those two actors, Justin and Barrett, and they they got deeply into it. And, and, and some great stuff came out of that that I that I take credit for as a writer. But it wasn't really they weren't my words. They were theirs, you know. And and also in terms of, of the building relationship between the two of them and kind of going back to some of what you were talking about at the beginning with the camera movement and the camera motion, the camera kind of comes in a lot closer on the two of them. You know, obviously their body language, they're physically closer together in the blocking of scenes, but it's also about the way that the camera is telling the story. And so what did you want the shifts to be in terms of that placement and the way that you were framing out shots to show the the development between that dynamic? Yeah, we worked a lot. That was all storyboarded, to, you know, to get the camera closer to them, to keep them in singles when they're not when they're not together, and then two shots when they are. Um, and that was all pretty well planned out. And then, but of course, you know, but I would shoot it two ways sometimes, so I'd have options in the editing room. But it was pretty carefully planned. And Ashley and I, the DP and I, um, just kind of instinctively know by this many movies we've done together how to do that but i mean we talk it over and we say and, and we have a philosophy and then we just kind of do it you know but we do it is pre-planned you're right yeah there's there's also um, a lot of production design elements in in different facets in this film and one of them in particular being jake's mom's place and the fact that she's been hoarding and holding on to everything for all these years so when he goes into his old bedroom nothing's been touched it's it's like he just left home at 17 the other day and then he's come back into that space um and so how did you find the the details of what you wanted represented in terms of what that space looked like and even just you know how worn and used and dusty are things going to feel knowing that this box has been in the corner of this room for 20 odd years yeah i i, I that was also so uh, it, first of all the, the hoarding was was something that I, that I wasn't familiar with so I, I was nervous that we could pull that off you know uh that was in the original book and and the other screenplay and i i didn't really relate to it but i did relate to her to the mom not touching his room so i put in things that i loved you know like i like uh, uh, uh on the road and um 
and and uh, a movable feast. The the books that I that I loved that I wanted him to read, uh, the French New Wave, which I also love. All this stuff I I gave him uh, because I related to it, and it made it easier for me. Let's make better mistakes next time. All this stuff is stuff uh, that was very personal to me, uh, and the basketball. Um, so that was all worked out in advance, um, and I thought it showed uh, how special he was to his mom. Uh, or uh, yeah, and that she didn't touch his room. She didn't fuck that up, you know. Like everything, oh, I, I probably shouldn't have said that word. Um, <laughs> anyway, I mean, and with that, with the character as well of his mom, there's always interesting facets in terms of how do you build a character that is central to the story, but that we're never going to see on screen because at the beginning of the movie, she's already passed away. So we're, we're never going to meet her throughout the story. And yet she's really integral to everything that Jake's going through. You know, even Rachel's fiance, Alan, that I think we see him on FaceTime for a brief moment, but we don't see any scenes of the two of them together and, and what that relationship dynamic looks like. And so what are some of the elements that come with building out characters that aren't necessarily in scenes, but still are central to the story? for you yeah we we had a flashback scene now that i think about it uh in the script that we cut before we started shooting of the mom uh, and him playing the piano for her uh but it just it seemed a little cloying to me i i didn't really love it and uh so we let that go um in, ter in terms of her boyfriend, I didn't. The one thing I didn't want was him to be a nerd. You know, I wanted him to be a, a great-looking guy, who, who most women would. He's a really good actor. The the, the actor that played, but um, that that women would understand why. You know, he he wasn't the dorky boyfriend that that they always have in these movies. You know. Why is she with this guy? I mean, he was a little cheap and stuff like that, but he was really cute, I thought, and and really cared about her and loved her. And that was the main thing for me. Because, you know, Justin is pretty gorgeous. So, I mean, you, you have to have somebody who, who would, you know, he's gorgeous, smart, he's a best-selling novel. He's got it all, except he's emotionally damaged, you know, but, you know, we all are, I suppose, to some extent. Right. And, and when it comes to building that as well, he's someone who's very intentionally, you know, kept kept his guard up, kept a lot of walls around him. Right. You know, there's again that that light element at the beginning where it sounds like he's going home to his girl, but his girl's his dog. And yeah, right. you know, that's the world that he's constructed for himself. And so how did you how did you navigate both looking at the book and the source material and the way that you wanted to tell this story, his relationship with his career and the notoriety? Because it always feels like it's about the writing, not about being known for what he does and, and the way that that, that makes him quite insular and quite introverted right uh in the book i, I well i can't really say because i never really um to be honest with you i never read the book uh we know all your secrets now <laughs> uh, um rebecca read it you know uh my my writing partner uh but um in the in the in the book and in 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 the screenplay before us th there was no indication of what kind of writer he was so he, he didn't it, the french resistance none of that stuff and he wasn't a person who um who had secrets and things like that oh, you had no idea what kind of writer he was originally so i we created that to give you an insight into his character that he really didn't deal with stuff when he was writing the character uh kind of reflected him in in his real life and um it's just adding that other layer you know it's uh, adding the layer of of the dog so he he wasn't he he he, he kind of hid his loneliness with his best friend being, you know, an Australian shepherd. So it, it, it those kind of touches. Um, and I wanted to, and the father in the, in the previous screenplay was married and had a wife. And I, I just thought that doesn't go with, I, I think he should be like Justin's character. They both lonely guys, you know, who lived alone and then connect it just much more impactful, I think. So it's a lot of stuff like that, um, that, that, that we added to, help deepen the story, you know, really, I guess. 
And when it came to the moment where he's he's telling her about his, you know, his brother and everything that happened and, and what was kind of the catalyst for how his family has ended up in this very distant space for him. Um, what was what was the genesis of the decision to have it be, OK, they're in the car, they've pulled up, they're stopped as they're waiting for a passing train. And then we as the audience actually have the audio of what he's saying drowned out because we're hearing the train passing by. Because, again, you kind of piece together the details and you don't need it. But what was the genesis of choosing to? Well, actually, it, yeah, that, that's a good question. The genesis of that, you're very good at this. Um, what we had, rec- I, I, I shot that scene and then I realized I'm telling the story twice. If he's, you know, so we, we shot the scene where he actually tells her about it. And then I, I thought, and they're on a train track. If I drown this out and we don't hear, we just hear little snippets it'll be more intriguing. I don't want to, I didn't want to tip the story. And I didn't realize that until uh, I was in the editing room. And and that's when we came up with that idea, which I think really helped. And thankfully, I, I you know, sometimes you, you can't think of everything, you, you know, you try, you do your best, but I think that helped the movie. And that's a yeah, really good point, by the way. I mean, I, I also love in terms of filmmaking, the way that there's so many things that it sounds like for you are just such a gut instinct at this point from the experience you've had, the projects that you've made. And, but also I've heard you say that even when you first directed that it always kind of felt that way because you'd grown up around it. You already knew a lot of the flow, a lot of the logistical elements, a lot of the lingo. And so what do you feel has been that building arc for you over the years of just, you know, your confidence building that, that gut instinct over the years of just walking onto a set and being like, this is how I'm going to tell the story. This is how I'm going to approach this scene. This well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I kind of grew up on movie sets because my dad was in the movie business. So like pretty much two or three Saturdays a month, I'd go because uh, he worked six days a week. Then I would go to the to, to a set with him and hang out. And so when I started to direct, well, I'd written three movies, co-written three movies, but I, I, I knew what a dolly grip was, you know, from when I was a little kid. So I, I was never intimidated by by. Uh, you know, the guys with the turquoise belts who were hanging out on a movie set, you know, I always, they were always nice to me and I always, I knew what they did and uh, it just felt like home to me. So I was never intimidated. And I was also a writer, which gives you a little bit more uh, self-confidence, you know, the actors, when you write this stuff yourself uh, and the actors ask you a question, you always know the answer. Now it may not gel with what they're thinking, but they can't really say, well, that, that's not what the writer was thinking, you know. So, uh, so I, I was always comfortable on movie sets. Um, uh, it's I'm I'm thankful to my dad for that. Yeah, basically. That's really wonderful. Well, I always really, really love the way that you you tell stories on screen, and this film is no exception. So, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it, Charles. Oh, great. These were good questions, by the way. <laughs>